John Dee was one of the most brilliant thinkers of the 16th century. A true Renaissance man, he was at the forefront of scientific and philosophical thought in one of the great ages of learning and discovery. Dee became a key figure in the Elizabethan court and one of Queen Elizabeth's most trusted advisers. But all this was not enough. In his insatiable quest for knowledge, Dee strayed into the forbidden world of the occult. He was trying to find the very essence of life. He was trying to find the secrets of the universe. And for John Dee, that meant communing with angels, communing with demons, risking his soul. I seek the treasure of heavenly wisdom and knowledge. So why do they condemn me as a companion of hellhounds and a conjurer of wicked and damned spirits? As Dee went deeper into the occult, he turned his back on Queen Elizabeth and set off on a journey that took him beyond the boundaries of religion and morality. He risked everything in his quest, and his diaries record how ultimately he became the instrument of forces beyond his control. Angel magic, whatever Dee said, was black magic. Dee was the model for Marlowe's Faust. Dee was the model for Shakespeare's Prospero. This is somebody who is the quintessential magician. This guy was prepared to storm heaven. John Dee was born in London in 1527. From an early age, he was regarded as an academic genius destined for greatness. He had an insatiable desire for knowledge and spent many years locked in his study, poring over books of every kind. He mastered Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, and became adept in astronomy, mathematics, cartography, navigation, and medicine. In the 16th century, the boundaries between superstition, magic, and science were blurred. Dee's work naturally took him into alchemy and other esoteric areas. The church viewed science with a great deal of suspicion, and some even believed that mathematics was a form of black magic. It was a period of enormous change in Europe. The world was in turmoil as age-old certainties were being shattered. Those who were pushing the boundaries of knowledge risked being burnt at the stake. Europe in the early 16th century is a place in spiritual meltdown. In one long generation, Europeans have discovered totally new continents and conquered large areas of them, invented the printing press, realized the full destructive potential of gunpowder, and at the same time, the traditional all-embracing Western church has split forever into Protestant and Catholic blocs. When Mary Tudor came to the throne in 1553, she returned England to Catholicism, and the smell of burning Protestant flesh spread over the country. In this atmosphere of religious paranoia, Mary's half-sister, Princess Elizabeth, was kept under house arrest in Oxfordshire. Elizabeth was a devout Protestant, and she became the focus for people's hopes of an end to the persecution. Her situation was bleak. She turned to Dee for help, asking him to cast her and Mary's horoscope. The Catholic Church viewed astrology with suspicion, and in such tense circumstances, casting royal horoscopes was a dangerous undertaking. Casting royal horoscopes in early modern Europe is one of the most dangerous things which uh, an astronomer or astrologer can get up to. If you can actually work out what the stars are saying, it could even be you're directing the stars. You might be steering the whole thing, in which case you're actually determining when the monarch's going to live or die, which is technical high treason. The horoscopes predicted that Elizabeth would come to the throne and enjoy a long and glorious reign. The prognosis for Mary was dire. 
When the horoscopes were discovered, Dee was thrown into jail. The charges read that he had endeavored to destroy the queen by calculating, conjuring, and witchcraft. For a while, he shares his prison with a man called Bartlett Green, who ends up one of the 300 odd Protestant martyrs made by Mary. In fact, he's actually taken away and executed uh, while Dee is in hold. And it must have concentrated Dee's mind wonderfully on how to survive. Three years later, Dee's astrological predictions came true. In 1558, Queen Mary died and Elizabeth came to the throne. The position of Queen Elizabeth at the opening of her reign is almost nightmarishly insecure. She is uh, a young woman who's not always in good health. She almost dies three times over in the first ten years of her reign. Her realm is surrounded by Catholics, and so she's an absolute sitting target for assassins in an age in which assassination is one of the uh, most common tricks of international politics. And so for somebody like her, to have somebody who is really brilliant and can actually fathom the secrets of the cosmos is a kind of secret weapon in her arsenal which might just give her the edge over her enemies. Elizabeth immediately appointed Dee her royal astrologer and asked him to choose a coronation date that would be blessed by the heavens. Dee found fame and favor under Elizabeth, and she dubbed him my noble intelligentsia, giving him license to work in complete freedom. She gave official sanction to Dee, pretty much declaring that anything he did was white magic, divine magic, a form of science, and putting the royal seal on that. This must have been very important, very useful for Dee. Well, she wasn't styled the fairy queen for nothing. She encouraged um, astrology, uh, magic, spectacle, and uh, she certainly encouraged Dee. Basically, Dee was in love with Elizabeth, as a lot of her courtiers were, but she had a strong linked to him too. She clearly saw him as somebody who she could trust. Dee lived at Mortlake on the River Thames, and there he assembled one of the greatest libraries of the 16th century. He traveled all over Europe in search of new learning, as well as books and manuscripts. He also gathered maps and the latest in navigational equipment. His knowledge of navigation helped spearhead England's great age of exploration and discovery. He even coined the expression, the British Empire. He provided the clearinghouse at Mortlake for all the latest navigational information, which formed the basis of the great age of exploration for, for English mariners across the Atlantic to the New World. Dee was not content with exploring the limits of the Earth. Inspired by men like Copernicus, he wanted to understand how the entire universe worked. If we want to look for a comparison with Dee among 20th century figures, a figure like Stephen Hawking, internationally respected scientist, fits it to a cameo. John Dee is a mathematical whiz kid. Mathematics is the key to astronomy, astrology, navigation, chemistry. And John Dee is arrogant enough and clever enough to reckon himself the man to find the key to all these things and show the world how they work. He was convinced there were hidden forces that govern the way the physical world works. But as the years passed, he began to despair of ever finding them. For 40 years continually, with great pain, care and cost, I have sought the best knowledge that man might attain in the world. I have found that neither any man living or book was able to teach me those truths I desired and longed for. Dee has looked into mathematics, he's looked into astrology and astronomy, he's, he's absorbed all these strands, but it still hasn't given him the thing that he wants. He now is prepared to go to the next step which is to go deep into the occult, into hidden knowledge, in order to try to find these secrets, the very secrets of nature. Dee was at the point of giving up his quest when he made the discovery that changed the course of his life. The Steganographia is an infamous black magic manuscript written in the 15th century. 
The book was written in a coded language that contained many barbarous and strange names of spirits. It was believed that these spirits were the key to a reservoir of hidden knowledge. Nowadays we're well aware that there are unseen powers that make the world work and manipulate human beings. Uh, apart from neutrons, protons, electrical charges, we also have viruses, bacilli, microbes. The people of John Dee's England couldn't see these things. They had some inkling they were there, and so they called them demons, spirits, and angels. In the 16th century, everyone saw angels and demons having a direct role in their lives. There was no controversial issue about the existence of spirits and angels and demons. I mean, they existed. They were part of the universe as it was understood then. And it would almost appear um, slightly cracked to imagine that they didn't exist. Dee now believed that the only way to find the answers that he was looking for was through the spirit world. But he found that he had no ability as a medium and turned to scryers for help. Scrying is an ancient occult art in which magicians use a crystal ball or mirror to take the mind out of the conscious world into the realm of the supernatural. The logic behind it was that angels were basically intermediaries with God. If you wanted to find out the word of God, the message of God, of course, traditionally, you should use the church, but in the midst of all this religious um, uh, turmoil, the angels provided effectively a sort of alternative route for a direct line to God. People who were dabbling in these areas were regarded as dangerous because they were, might release these dangerous forces into the world through their activities. These attempts at scrying yielded nothing until a man with a notorious reputation as a black magician appeared at Mortlake. His name was Edward Kelly. Kelly was a strange, difficult, fractious, troublesome character. I mean, as soon as he came into Dee's life, Dee's, Dee became involved in something that was way beyond his control. John Dee was somebody who was trying to find a way in to the world of the occult. When Kelly turned up, all of a sudden, Dee was provided with what seemed to be a key to that door. At the age of 55, Dr. John Dee's quest to find the secrets of the universe had led him to enlist the services of Edward Kelly, black magician, necromancer, and alchemist. From the moment that Dee and Kelly began their occult partnership, Dee's diaries describe an astonishing supernatural world opening up to them. So you can perhaps imagine Dee, Kelly, a study full of books. What would start the ball rolling would be Kelly. He would be peering into a polished black mirror or into a crystal ball. If the ritual worked correctly, then entities would be summoned. They would then appear in the crystal to Kelly at which point him and Dee would interrogate whatever it appeared to them. Dee was excited and intrigued by Kelly's incredible visions. He was desperate to find out what and who these entities were. Suddenly, this extraordinary cast of angelic characters erupted from the crystal ball that he used, from sort of coquettish young maids to these great giants with suns blazing from their eyes. <laughs> He constantly struggled with the angels. I mean, he was constantly questioning whether or not he should believe them. He was questioning whether or not they were angels or whether, in fact, they were demons disguised as angels. There are entities whose speech was so apocalyptic, so cold and beautiful and terrifying, that even to modern ears, this is scary stuff.
in this day and age we don't believe in angels, but at the time it was truly believed that spirits were behind things, and through the spirits, it was God himself was behind these spirits or angels. So Dee's not messing around here. Dee thinks he's locked, locked into angelic communications. During the course of what became known as the angelic conversations, 70 different spirits would appear to Kelly. Some appeared human, others monstrous and demonic. They were angels they recognized from ancient versions of the Bible. But many of the spirits, like the beautiful coquettish maiden Medimi, were mysterious and unheard of. D fervently recorded every last detail of the scrying sessions in his diary. D was working in a world where it wasn't magic that he was doing, it was a science of angels. This is somebody approaching this unearthly territory with incredible scientific method. And Dee was clearly bewitched by this extraordinary set of creatures that Kelly presented to him. And not only were the, were the angels sort of interesting, they were delivering fantastic material. They seemed to be delivering some sort of coded message that would reveal the secrets of the universe. Dee was now convinced that he was close to fulfilling his ultimate ambition, and the angelic conversations took over his life and work. Mortlake would never be the same again. Dee's young wife, Jane, detested Kelly. She believed that he was evil and that the angelic conversations would lead them to ruin. Angel magic's an odd one. It is, uh, despite wearing these ostentatious trappings of piety, at core black magic. In some ways, it's difficult to think of anything more blasphemous than trying to get the angels of the Lord to do your bidding. While Dee was in the midst of his seances with Kelly at Mortlake, this extraordinary figure, this Polish prince called Lasky, turned up on the royal barge. He was doing a tour of the country at the time. And he actually managed to work his way into these seances, which was an incredibly dangerous thing uh, to be involved in. Lasky's presence at Mortlake was now raising grave concerns at court. When Elizabeth was trying to steer a very careful course uh, through European politics, when her rivals were far more powerful and were all Catholic, meant that almost certainly Dee's association with Lasky meant he was being followed, he was being watched. They were wondering if an influential character like Dee, who, remember, still had this kind of dubious reputation in the popular mind, was involved in something he shouldn't be. Informers working for Elizabeth's chief spymaster, Sir Francis Walsingham, now had Mortlake under constant surveillance. The atmosphere there grew increasingly tense as the angel Madimi revealed, through Kelly, that Walsingham was plotting Dee's downfall. Madimi appeared to us and said, they will shortly lay a bait for thee. They are determined to search your house. They hate thee. Trust them not. In Mortlake, things become more and more paranoid, and they're, they're fearful of spies in England. And Madimi, uh, their angel, is telling them that they must leave, and they must follow Lasky, who will be their patron, and they will be able to pursue the language of the angels over in Poland. He knew how dangerous it was to be involved in the kind of activities that him and Kelly were involved in, and he carried on with them. He risked everything for this. There was a great tempest of wind at midnight as we left Mortlake with our wives and children toward two ships waiting for us near Gravesend. So Dee decides to up and leave, take his family, and on the words of Medini, go to Poland. And if he does this, the angels have promised him great secrets are going to be revealed. I mean, this is an amazing thing for him. It's a lifetime, a one-time opportunity to try to find out 
why we're here, how things work, why they work. And the angels have promised him that. So yeah, of course, you're going to go along with what the angels say. Why wouldn't you? As soon as Dee left Mortlake, a mob descended upon the house and his library and alchemical laboratories were ransacked. For Dee, Kelly and their families, there was no going back. After an epic six-month journey, Dee and Kelly finally arrived in the Polish capital, Krakow. As soon as they got there, they began scrying again and the angelic messages were delivered with even greater intensity. It seemed to Dee that his unshakable faith in the angels was about to be rewarded. They are told that there's something, a powerful message is going to be dictated to them. The first angel begins to talk to them about a, a lost book of Enoch, which is the language of the angels, the original language spoken by Adam before the fall. The angel told us I will open to thee the secrets of nature and the riches of the world. Many thousand secrets in which you are still yet but children. This was the same language that was revealed to Enoch, who in biblical tradition was the first person to speak with God after the fall of man. The language, it is said, is the power by which we were all made, by which nature was framed and the whole universe was constructed. It is the very mathematics, it is the very framework of all the mystery of all creation. Dee believed that the language he was about to receive would be the key to unlocking the secrets of the universe. Letter by letter, the dictation of the Enochian language began. After months of scrying and hundreds of hours looking into the crystal ball, the angels revealed what appeared to be a completely new language. The Enochian language is designed to express the primal essence of things. When it's spoken, it's supposed to be spoken from the stomach, from using the magical voice. It's a very barbarous and rich sounding language. Gahey, Istiva, Kahiza, Mi. Mikael Izodu. Spirits of ye fourth angle are nine, mighty in the firmament of the waters. Allah The Enochian language is based on an alphabet of 22 letters. The language has its own words, grammar and syntax, and resembles no known tongue. Although some scholars have compared it to Hebrew, attempts to discover its origins have been unsuccessful. To suppose that this is an invented language, invented by Kelly, you would have to suppose that Kelly was some sort of creative and linguistic genius who was able to spontaneously invent a functional working language complete with grammar and vocabulary, and not only invent it, but invent it backwards. With the dictation of the Enochian language complete, the angel set D an extraordinary test. And as he's receiving this angelic data very, very fast, and he can hardly keep up, all of a sudden, out of the blue, Medimi says that he has to go and see Rudolf II, the most powerful man, the ruler of Bohemia and of the Holy Roman Empire. And he has to go and tell him that he is possessed, he's an evil man. It's like a death sentence if he goes. Dee had already given up everything in England in his thirst for hidden knowledge. But was his belief in the angels strong enough to carry out this suicidal mission? In August 1584, John Dee made his way to Prague to confront the Holy Roman Emperor. He was effectively an enemy, and this enemy figure went into the very heart of the enemy territory, to the seat of power in Prague. In the 16th century, the Holy Roman Empire 
was a vast kingdom that covered the large part of northern Europe. The empire was ruled by Rudolf II, a notoriously enigmatic and volatile man. Rudolf was a great patron of alchemists and indulged his passion for the bazaar with his own personal regiment made up entirely of dwarves. The Holy Roman Empire was vital to Rome in the uneasy balance of power between the Catholic and Protestant churches. This is Rudolf's palace. This is the very church that Dee would have had to walk past on his way to the confrontation with Rudolf. And this gives you an idea of the power of the church, the money and the power that it has. And this is what he's taking on. a heretical Protestant and he's about to give a message to Rudolf that he's been asked to give by the angels and this is a lethal thing to do his back is right up against the wall now he's probably shaking in his shoes he's terrified for his own family the angel of the Lord hath appeared to me and rebuketh you for your sins if you will not hear me the Lord will sweep you off the face of the earth and you shall perish miserably and the message he has to say that, is that Rudolf is an evil man, that he has demons around him, and that if he doesn't listen to Dee and the angels and what they have to say, that God will put his foot on Rudolf's breast and push him off his throne. But if he does listen to the angels, uh, then he will become a supreme emperor and will overcome the devil. He is a man going into very much the lion's den of Roman Catholicism and saying, you must live and rule according to the revelation that I have. Here we see Dee in the role as prophet. Here we see Dee as a man convinced of his mission and willing to put his life on the line to deliver that message. Rudolf was both astounded and intrigued by Dee's speech. Whilst Dee waited anxiously for the Emperor's reaction, the angels became impatient, ordering Dee to deliver a new message to Rudolf. It was obvious that some new PR strategy was needed on behalf of the angels. It was at this point that the angels apparently suggested to Dee that the Philosopher's Stone would be enough of a crowd puller to get people like Rudolf on their side. When Edward Kelly first arrived at Mortlake, he had a small bag of red powder that he said had been stolen from an ancient site at Glastonbury. He believed it to be the vital ingredient that would help make the Philosopher's Stone. The Philosopher's Stone being the formula that would basically give the person who had it the alchemical means of turning base metal into gold, but also any form of sort of purification, indeed the secret of life, effectively. This Philosopher's Stone was a world-changing concept. The Philosopher's Stone was the H-bomb. If you had the Philosopher's Stone, you had complete financial and thus military superiority of every other nation in the world. Rudolf chose to ignore Dee's ominous prophecy, but the prospect of finding the Philosopher's Stone proved irresistible. He decided to allow Dee and Kelly to set up an alchemical laboratory in Bohemia. Dee and Kelly set about trying to produce gold. The dream of finding the Philosopher's Stone had been an obsession in Europe for centuries. With advances in chemistry and metallurgy, the belief that it might be possible to make gold from base metal reached a fever pitch in 16th century Bohemia. Czeski Krumlov was one of the great centers for alchemy, and some of the original alchemical materials still survive. This has to be the part of the building where they were. Oh, all kinds of stuff in here. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, look. 
These are definitely alchemical. This is some sort of scroll. Or? Scroll. It's got uh, some mm. symbols here. Oh, oh wow! Look, look at that. that. Definitely mm. a magical text then. Yeah. Yeah, look, oh, it's definitely, yeah. 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 There's a magical spell there. Yeah. A satora. Yeah, let's see, Arapo yep. here, Opera yep. here. Rotas at the bottom. Sator, yeah. Sator Rotas. Yes. And something to do with Solomon's key. Oh, key of Solomon. Oh, my goodness, what is this? What's that? That's definitely powder, isn't it? It's definitely a powder. Mm. This could be the very powder that they were using to produce gold 500 years ago. Oh, here, in their experiments? Here, here in Bohemia, yeah. Wow. They truly believe they can make gold, yes. And... Rumours that the famous Dr. D had found the secret of the Philosopher's Stone spread across Europe like wildfire. You can see why people like the Tsar in Russia would have been offering D and Kelly a fortune to go and work as the Russian alchemist. You can see why Elizabeth herself was getting nervous, was worried in case D and Kelly were out there creating gold for foreigners, in which case she was insistent that they be returned home to create gold for England. Throughout this period, the angelic conversations continued. The angels repeatedly told D that he would soon be given the key to using the Enochian language. When the Pope heard that D was being granted audiences with Emperor Rudolf, he sent spies to investigate. The Catholic authorities in particular did not regard Dee as some sort of dodgy sorcerer who had just come in and was trying to make trouble. Papal authorities saw Dee basically manipulating Rudolf in a way that would be dangerous to their own needs, their own tactics. The Pope's spies reported back to Rome that Dee was an important and dangerous adversary and the author of a new heresy predicting that Rome was about to fall. Anybody who claims to have God's personal mobile number is a tremendous threat to the established church. The church, in spiritual terms, is a collection of middlemen. If you had an entire population who were capable of communicating with spiritual forces for themselves, then popes, priests, cardinals, bishops, all of these would have been redundant. That was the threat that John Dee posed to the religious authorities. Anybody who had information or knowledge which didn't fit with the established orthodoxy was cruising for a bruising. Pope Sixtus, determined to get rid of Dee at any cost, presented a document to the emperor accusing Dee of being a black magician. Papal ambassadors made repeated demands to question Dee, and they tried to seize the heretical books of angelic conversations. Finally, the Pope demanded that Dee and Kelly come to Rome. Being asked questions by the Inquisition was seldom a uh, comfortable position to be in, not least because the entire process could quite easily end up with you being barbecued. They refused to go to Rome, but Pope Sixtus finally forced Emperor Rudolf to expel Dee and his family from the Holy Roman Empire. They were given six days to get out of the empire and fled Prague in fear for their lives. Expulsion from the Holy Roman Empire once again saw John Dee, Edward Kelly and their families on the run. With nowhere to go and no prospects of patronage, things were looking desperate when they received word that a nobleman from southern Bohemia requested their alchemical services. Even more surprising, Emperor Rudolf had sanctioned the arrangement. The relief that John Dee must have felt after being persecuted, kicked out, the Pope's after him, He's got nowhere to stay. His family's stuffed into two carriages with all his books and possessions. And finally, he's allowed to find sanctuary here in Trevon, in Rosenberg's castle. 
Elizabeth I wasn't a real patron to John Dee. He wasn't funded enough to pursue his experiments and his science. For the first time, this is a safe haven for them. It's a sanctuary. Rudolf II was under extreme pressure from the Pope, but believed that Dee and Kelly were on the verge of finding the formula of the Philosopher's Stone. He did not want to openly defy the Pope and secretly installed them in alchemical laboratories in the town of Trebon, a hundred miles south of Prague. The pressure was now on to produce gold, and Kelly wanted to devote all of his energy to alchemy. He became increasingly reluctant to enter into the angelic conversations that he felt were leading nowhere. Dee wanted more than material wealth, and refused to let go of what he saw as a greater prize. He had risked everything for the angels. Along with the Enochian language, they had revealed to him what appeared to be an entire magical system. He believed that once the angels gave him the key to these things, all would be revealed to him. Time after time, he forced Kelly back to the crystal to continue with the angelic conversations. He pushes Kelly almost to exhaustion. They're scrying for 10 hours a day, and Kelly suffers because of this. He gets headaches, he gets pangs in his stomach, he hears voices in his head. He even has wheels on his arm, which he says demons have given him through attacks. It's a dangerous task because also the angels could be demons. you were looking at the world in the glass probably more often than you were looking at the world outside the glass. You can see how that could take you mentally into some very dangerous territory indeed. He was suddenly plunged through a trapdoor in Elizabethan logic into this world. Many, many times he recorded his own body inflamed, engulfed in flame, his mind burning, his body burning. Many times he struggled with the revelation, trying to understand more deeply, but at the same time terrified of what he was experiencing. Kelly knew it was black magic and got cold feet on this account on a number of occasions. And it was always Dee who talked him round. Indeed, there are a number of occasions when uh, Kelly's visions took on a uh, demonic, hellish character. And uh, this didn't seem to trouble Dee at all. Edward Kelly was in a reality where he was working with this psychopath. This guy was prepared to conjure all the forces of heaven and hell. The angelic conversations were becoming increasingly sinister. The angel Madimi seemed now to have lost her innocence and, according to Kelly, began to showeth her shame. Right in the middle of all of this, something extraordinary happens. It's just absolutely off the map. If everything else has been extraordinary, this is off the map. They carry on the angelic conversations here and it takes a very sinister and very strange twist because Medimi, their spirit guide, their angel, uh, makes a request. They get asked to do something very bizarre. Medimi appeared and she said, nothing is unlawful which is unlawful unto God. One committing adultery on my behalf shall be blessed eternally and given a heavenly reward. The angels, or Medimi, reveals herself naked in the crystal and says that they have to cross-match with each other's wives. Dean Kelly have to swap wives. Now, this is a terrible thing. Jane Dee detests Kelly. Poor Jane has cries for 15 minutes. She won't do it. Kelly's not happy. He thinks they're in league with demons. Really, it must seem like they are now to be asked to do such a terrible thing. But for Dee, it's a final test for him to get the secrets of nature at the end of this. He will reach the next level, go to the next stage. The test seemed to be an affront to the laws of God, and it shook Dee to the core. 
He had risked everything for the angels, but was he now prepared to risk his soul? And he battles against it, and he says he won't do it, and he says he can't do it, and then he gives in. And um, ultimately, he becomes the instrument of the angels. Ultimately, they take him over, and he does everything that they tell him to do. So here, they draw up a contract after two days that they all solemnly sign, and they do go ahead and record it in Dee's diary, the pact is fulfilled. I can see there is no other remedy but for our cross-matching. So it must be done. I offer my soul as a pawn. There is something very empowering about the breaking of taboo. Certain sex practices are seen as being able to enhance magical awareness to put you into a different state of consciousness. Laying there in a room, listening to your wife have sex with your business associate and magical associate, while you were laying there with their wife, this very real physical act might have been a step too far. This was as far from theory as it could possibly get. So there's actually much more going on spiritually than just some wife swapping here. They're not just swingers, they're sinners. And in Renaissance Europe, that really is tampering with eternity. But it spells the absolute end of Dee and Kelly. Nothing is the same again. Um, it changes everything, and the angelic conversations come to an end. For Dee, the wife swapping did not produce a great revelation. And after seven years of tireless scrying, Kelly finally freed himself of Dee and the angelic conversations. He devoted himself to alchemy and was invited to work directly for Rudolf in Prague. Suddenly, Kelly appeared to have found the secret formula of the Philosopher's Stone. He became famous throughout Europe. He was made a baron, given a castle, and lived a life of outrageous success. He's personally working with Rudolf II on alchemical experiments, making gold. He seems to be able to make gold, and people witness it, they see it, and word spreads like wildfire. Um, even right the way back to England, Elizabeth I sends out spies to come over and try and get Kelly back. Kelly's fall was as swift as his rise. He was unable to produce unlimited quantities of gold, and Rudolf threw him in prison. Was it because Rudolf realized that he'd been the victim of a clever con trick, or that Kelly refused to reveal his secret formula? No one will ever know the truth, as Kelly died attempting to escape from prison. Although we never really know the truth about Kelly's death, Dee does mention him in his diary as a small entry. He just says, Kelly is slain. This extraordinary relationship, this partnership, the greatest occult partnership ever, is finally come to an end. With Kelly's death, the angelic conversations were at an end. The promises of the angels had come to nothing, and Dee's dream of finding the secrets of the universe was over. Dee returned to England in 1589. Queen Elizabeth had lost interest in her noble intelligentsia, and Dee was desperately short of money. The final blow came when his wife Jane gave birth to a boy, the product of her unholy union with Kelly. What was passing through Dee's mind in those last days? Did I get it wrong? Did I think that they were saying to me something that was just me, was just my hopes and fears projected? 
were they ever there at all? Dee never questioned the validity of his angelic actions in the sense that he never thought he'd just been defrauded by Kelly, um, that he'd been strung a line. He believed in them right to the end. He buried his papers or hid them in, in secret drawers in, in chests. That's how they were found subsequently. He did so because he wanted the message to be carried on into future generations. Dr. John Dee died in 1608. He never deciphered the Enochian language, but it formed the basis of a magical system that continues to be practiced by occultists. The language's origin and what happened between Dee and Kelly during the angelic conversations remains a mystery. Dee has suffered a lot at the hand of history. You could say he backed the wrong intellectual horse. Certainly few people today are interested in angel magic outside of the fringes of the occult. I think we should remember him as someone who is willing to risk everything to know. Someone for whom the pursuit of knowledge was worth risking his body, his immortal soul, his reputation, everything. All Dee wanted to find was the truth. The paths he went down, the extraordinary lengths he went to, and what, what is left is inexplicable. It's an enigma, it's a mystery. But in the end, Dee did it because he wanted to find out the real truth behind everything. Today, no one believes that angels can provide the answers to the secrets of the universe. But modern science has shown that Dee's instincts were fundamentally correct. Scientists have now discovered that there are unseen forces that govern the physical world. We are surrounded by ugliness and war and inhumanity and squalor we perhaps all have feelings that things should be better than this that there is something beneath the skin of reality that would make sense of all this and you can certainly see what an attractive vision that is how it might be worth sacrificing everything for just the slimmest chance of that heaven-opening possibility.